So I work in a public school. And uh, because I'm in the trenches, I can tell you exactly what's wrong with public schools. Um, and and to, to, to tell you, uh, I want to do it through a story. Eri Shithon, he, uh, he goes into this, this, uh, this grove. And it's one of the most sacred groves of, of the goddess Ceres, who is the goddess of Earth. And he goes in there, and he's just an angry man. He goes in there, and he takes his axe. He sees the most beautiful oak, the tallest oak tree in, in the, the grove. And he takes that axe, and he just starts hitting that thing, starts hitting that thing. What he didn't know was this was the sacred tree of the dryad, dryads, and they danced around this tree. And they were so upset, they started crying. And great blood started going out of this tree. And this tree wept, and it started talking, what are you doing to me? And he kept on chopping and chopping and chopping, and the tree falls down. The dryads, they were so upset, they ran to the goddess Ceres, the goddess of the earth. And they said, Ceres, the sacred tree is no more. And she said, who did this? Who has done such a thing? Erishithon. And she goes to the deep, dark places to find famine. And she finds famine. And she takes famine. And she says, famine, you must go and do what Erishithon has done to the most sacred oak tree. And so she goes to Erishithon. And she wraps her arms. And she comes into him. And all he finds is hunger within his life. This insatiable need to eat and eat and eat, and he can't stop eating. And so he sells all of his riches to find food that he can eat. And then he runs out of money, so he sells his daughter. And his daughter, as she was sold into slavery, she says, oh God, Poseidon, please, please take me from this. I no longer want to be a slave. And so Poseidon, he answered her prayers, and he goes to her and she says, you have the gift to turn into anything you want to. She turns into a fisherman. And as she turns into a fisherman, her master behind her, he said, where did that girl go? And the fisherman says, I am the only one that's been here. And the girl, she goes back to her father. Not a very healthy relationship. And the father, he's so happy and he says, whoa, I can keep selling your daughter. She told me what she did and I can keep making money to satisfy my need to eat and eat and eat. And he did so. And his daughter, she turned into a mare to escape. She turned into a bird to escape. But soon, it just wasn't enough. And Erishethon, he turned upon himself and devoured him. What an awesome story. I want to tell another story now, if I can. There's a man by the name of John Keats. He was a poet, and he gives this a quote. He, he, he gives this quote. I find that I cannot exist without poetry. Half the day will not do. His early enthusiasm for finding poetry and purpose expressed in some of his poems uh, and uh, Sleep in Poetry is, is one of his, his popular poems. And, and uh, one night it came his desire for this great need for poetry. He goes to a dinner party with some friends and all night they talked about poetry. Now that's a dinner party I want to go to. <laughs> but he said, I was just so excited after everything we talked about. I could not sleep that night. I had a waking dream of my destiny. He started when he was 18 years old. And unfortunately for us, he only lived till he was 25. But in that time, he has some of the most beautiful poems. Not necessarily popular at the time, but they have been popular for the ages. Eileen Ward, she's the biographer of Keats, she says, look, Keats didn't come in and he just wasn't this amazing poet like we had of Shakespeare or Milton and others of the past. He had to work so hard for this. And he worked and he worked and he worked at this destiny that was in him. And now today, we still read his poetry and we try to take 
from the poetry to see some of the greatness within it. In the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, it says, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. We have a generation of Erishathons. It starts from the top, even unto the nation, and it comes down to the kids today. They eat, they eat, they eat, and there is nothing for them. We have taken the substance out of public schools. But if we find what is within us, like Keats, we awake to that destiny of our own unique purpose. The problem today is we have a 19th century school system. We have 20th century teachers and 20th, 21st century students. They do not connect. Einstein said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. How did that come about? And after the Civil War, we started the Industrial Revo Revolution. And there was this great push in the 19th century for the industrial age. And we needed factory workers. And we've continued to have those factory workers over and over. And then we move into the 20th century, the information age, where we have knowledge at our fingertips. And with this, we have the teachers who are knowledge workers. Here's more. Here's more knowledge. Here's more knowledge. But today, we need 21st century students, something of substance for them. We need students who are creators, empathizers. And we need students who know how to lead because we lack leadership in our nation today. Hope, empathy, innovation, entrepreneurs, leaders, they are born, undying, listen to these words, unbounded, unlimited, ineffable, inexpressible, noble to the mind and to the five senses. How do we discover this personal masterpiece within us. We'll never find it if we continue to teach with the old model. Because instead of creating leaders, we'll create a lifeless robotic nation. Gordon McKenzie, he went around to all the schools. He's an artist and he really wanted to find across, the, he went across the nation. And he really wanted to find, okay, Let's see what these, this generation coming up of America, where are they at? And he goes out and he finds these kindergartners and he says, kindergartners, how many of you are going to change the world? And they all stand up and say, yeah! And he was amazed. Oh my gosh, look at the passion. And he's like, how many of you are going to do something great with your life? Woo! How many of you have such great purpose? And they all said, yeah! And he goes to first grade. And the same thing. They all stand up. And yes, we're going to change the world. And then he gets to second grade. And he says, how many of you, come on, will change this world? Three-fourths of them raise their hand. He says, OK, that's still good. That's still pretty good. And then he goes to third grade. And by the time he gets to sixth grade, not one of those kids raised their hands. In fact, they looked around at each other and were embarrassed for those that were even thinking about taking that deviant behavior of thinking that I will change the world one day. How do we find this? June 22, 1911. It was Billy's 13th birthday. It was also the day that he would become a man. And as he becomes a man, he's going to, like his father and his grandfather before him, 
go down into the pit. They were miners. And as the family gave Billy his birthday hugs and kisses and wishes, they all said, Billy, it's time to go to the pit. Just like your dad, just like your grandpa. Do us proud. Billy was scared to death. But he was going to be a man. He wasn't going to cry, even though he saw that tear in his mom's eye. And his mom said something to him. She pulled him aside and said, Billy, remember, Jesus is with you, even in the pit. And he goes and he finds all the other miners. And here they are. They're seasoned men. They're rough men with beards. He doesn't have a beard. He doesn't even have hair on his legs. And he goes down into the pit. He gets into the cage with these men. And he goes down into the pit. At that time, they were all led. They were given uh, a partner to work with. And Billy, he saw this broad man with a sneer in his eyes. He gave him his lantern and his shovel. He said, follow me. And they walked. And they walked through the pit, through the mines, all over. And Billy said, this, why are we moving away from everybody? This is a little bit scary. And so the man with the sneer, he says, Billy, see this muck over here? You're going to shovel it. And Billy says, but aren't you going to stay with me? And he said, no, Billy, I've got other things to do. Here's your lamp in the land left. Billy was all alone. And then his lamp went out. He was in the dark. He tried to hold up his shovel, and he couldn't see one inch in front of him. He said, this is what it's like to be blind. But he knew that this was something that the men were doing to him to see if he could stand being in the mine. Could he go back to the mine? So he says, I'm going to show them, and I'm going to work. And so he shoveled into the draw. He shoveled and shoveled. And he said, how much time has passed? He was scared. We are afraid of the dark. It's when we feel most vulnerable. And here's this little boy all alone. And as he's shoveling, he starts feeling hungry. And so he opens up his pail and he hears these little squeaks. They were rats. They're trying to climb up his arm to get to the food. He's even more scared. But then he remembered, remember, Billy, Jesus is always with you, even in the pit. And so he did what only he could remember to do. He started singing hymns to pass the time. He shoveled and he sang hymns. He shoveled and he sang hymns. See, back in those days, not many people could read in, in, at that stage in, in Great Britain in the lower class families. And so he had to memorize the hymns as he went to Sunday school. Nor, if they could read, could they afford to buy a hymn book. And so he had all this reservoir of hymns stored up. And he sang and he sang. Many hours passed. And the man came back and he said, Billy, what happened to your lamp? And Billy said, you know what happened to my lamp. And the man sneered and he smiled. And Billy, as he was leaving, he saw a bearded man. And he said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And as they get back to the men, all the men said, Billy, what happened to your lamp down here? Were you scared? Billy said, I was scared. I was scared. I'm not going to lie. And he said, well, Billy, how long were you without light? And he said, 10 hours. And they looked at the man with the sneer, and they said, it was only supposed to be an hour. And they said, Billy, how did you make it through that? 
And he said, because Jesus was with me. And after that, they all called him Billy with Jesus. We lack the spirit in the classroom setting. Because without that, we lack innovation. We lack creativity. We lack the beauty of life. We lacked the most important things. And our life becomes out of balance. But we don't have to necessarily make it Sunday school to bring in the spirit to a classroom. We don't have to say the words God. We don't have to say the words Jesus Christ. If I did, I would get fired. But we can bring in the spirit by bringing out the genius within them. And when we hear the word genius, we think of who? <laughs> we think of who? Einstein. Einstein. Well, we can learn a lot from Einstein, but not the way we think. Genius actually comes from the Latin root. And from Greek, it's a verb meaning to bring into, to bring into being through a guiding spirit. Oh, what? Well, that's, how is that today? Because we get, if you know six, well, that equation and this, the science and math. Well, you guiding spirit. You bring out what's within you. The guiding spirit that brings out within you. So how does this work? How do we have a balanced public school system? How do we have one that really inspires and brings out the best of children? Well, I can only do it through telling a story about my wife, who's my soulmate. And I'll tell you why. When we first think of the word soulmate, we think of, oh my gosh, we, we love the same candies. She finishes my sentences. Oh my goodness, we both love dot, dot, dot. And that's how it was for me, right? Through the engagement process. Honey, what do you like? I like what you like. What do you like? I, I love what you like. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm marrying my soulmate. This is great. But then the honeymoon ends. It's over. I love to read. I'm an avid reader. And she's from California, so we got long road trips. And I think, oh, goody, we just get to read together and discuss the books. But then finally, it comes out of her. She says, look, um, how do I say this? Um, I, I, can I just listen to my music? Because I don't really, you know. I'm not as into that as I, maybe you thought I was. And I thought, what? I, did, I didn't marry my soulmate. And I was devastated. And then to come to find out, me and my wife have nothing in common, <laughs> right? <laughs> We're still married. <laughs> but it became beautiful, the process of being married to her. Because she helped me progress. If you take the natural man and the spiritual man, we need both. Because we've lived too much with the natural man, boy, what an ugly life that is, right? That's the French, French Revolution. If we live too much in the spiritual man, we lose what life is really about because we live in this utopia. We need both of them to come together and balance out our lives. That's how we learn. That's how we experience the good, the bad. That's the power of a soulmate. They help us to become better. So let's look at our brain, the soulmates, right brain, left brain. President Obama, God bless his soul, within a decade, he gives this quote, within a decade, American students must move from the middle of the pack to the top of the pack in science and math. And we see over time that the public school system is this really big muscle of this left brain. And it grows and it grows and then what starts happening is we take these little kids and we start testing their IQ in kindergarten. My kindergarten teacher said I would amount to nothing. She was right. 
And then we study their skills in reading and math. And then we study and we put all of those scores and we test them against other people in the state. And then we test them against other people in the nation. And then we test them against the world. To where we get quotes by President Obama saying, we need more math and science, we need more big left brain. And so our success in life is determined by how well we did on a test. My valedictorian that I graduated with was not so successful. We become computers, linear, sequential, and bounded by time. We are zoned in, we focused, but we failed to see through those blinders the beauty of this world like Keats. My life has a destiny, a purpose. Says author Robert Ornstein, the right mind is a seat of creativity of the soul. It is the power center, it's the spirit. Anything is possible. Empathy, relationships, love's questions, ceremony. I once spoke at a private school, I spoke at their graduation and they gave the kids not a report card upon their graduation, they gave them a replica of a sword from the Civil War. And I was like, oh my gosh, I wanna get in that class. <laughs> we need ceremony in our life. It's our bright brain that makes things so sacred and special for us. And as we bring ceremony into children's life and give them that progression of you can have and be whatever you want. But the most important thing is we ask them, how does this learning apply to you? How does it apply to you? See, without that, learning is meaningless. And it doesn't matter what, where that learning is, whether it's within the home, whether it's within the school, whether it's a private school. If you do not ask that question, how it applies to me, you are missing that destiny. I told you we could learn from Albert Einstein. He said this. Many parents, they saw him as the greatest genius that ever lived during his lifetime. And they all got together and they wanted to listen to Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, tell us, what do our kids need to do to become a genius like you? And they were all ready, they had their pens out, they had their paper out. Okay, what equations, what, the math, the science, okay, what equations do we need to learn? What do I want to jam down my kids' throats? Huh? What do we need to do? And Albert Einstein said, wait for it, here it is, he's about to tell them, read them more fairy tales. <gasps> what? Read them more fairy tales. It works. Read them more fairy tales. Well, what do you mean by that, Albert? It opens up their mind. See, when we teach through stories and we teach through fairy tales, then we start asking the question, how does that, how does that apply to me? How did Jesus teach? Through parables. Because it's different. The learning is different for everybody. And it reaches within the soul and it deepens their creativity. Albert Einstein has once said that he could see in his mind, as he was sitting in his patent office, the laws of relativity, he would see them happen spiritually in his mind. It didn't come from some equation. It helped that he had that background, but it came through his own creativity. It said that he saw a man falling off a building. In his, he saw that in his mind, and that brought out this Oh my goodness, he saw some construction workers. They were working on top of a building and in his mind he thought, what if one of them fell off? Oh my goodness. It was this creativity that brought about some of the greatest laws that we have and understand today because of him. Our kids, we destroy that within them. And it's destroyed by the time they're in sixth grade. No longer do we believe in Santa Claus because they gotta get going, they gotta be successful, they've gotta get their math and sciences, we gotta compete with China and Japan. 
But the problem is we take the best part from them, their souls and their destiny. My daughter, she hate me if I, you know, she knew the true story behind this. But. My daughter, she uh, lost a tooth. And she was really excited because that means cha-ching, right? Money. And my wife says, look, I've got to go to bed early. I don't feel real well. And I was working two jobs, and I got home really late. And I said, no, 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 I'll take care of it. Don't you worry. And I get home, and there's that little thing. I, I missed it. I forgot all about the, the, the money, right? And I lay in my bed, and I go to sleepy land. And then I awaken to the sound of this. Ah! It was my daughter. <laughs> The tooth fairy didn't come last night. And I thought, as I looked over and saw the money, I thought, oh my, what have I done? And I run to her room. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. what's going on here? Well, I even wrote the tooth fairy a letter. And I'm like, oh, I'm the worst dad in the world. Well, what? It, maybe there's an answer to this. Let's think of something that might have happened. What could it be? Well, I don't know, maybe, maybe, you know, I did sleep downstairs for half the night, and, and maybe you came when I was sleeping downstairs, and yes, that's exactly what happened! And she wanted you to be there! And I'm like, okay, good dad, good dad, I'm still on time, okay? <laughs> well, what you need to do tonight then, honey, is you need to sleep in your own bed. Oh, dad, I will do that, yes, I'm gonna sleep in my own bed. And so I lay her sloppily in her bed, go to sleep, go to sleep, and then I fell asleep. And then I wake up. <laughs> Not again! And I said, oh no, worst dad ever. I am awful. I hate myself. I hate myself. Right? It's hard being a parent sometimes. And so, <laughs> I go and I take my daughter. I bring her, I wrap her up in my arms. I say, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I hate myself. I hate myself. <laughs> Well, Dad, what does this mean? What does this mean? I said, honey, I'll tell you exactly what this means. The Tooth Fairy wants you to see her for yourself. Well, Dad, I don't know how, what do you mean you want me to see her? Like she's just gonna come to me? I said, yes, she is. I said, come on, let's sit down on the couch here for a second. Well, Dad, how do, how do I do that? I said, you gotta open up your mind. Oh, you gotta, I gotta open up my mind? You've gotta open up your mind. Okay, I'll open up my mind, Dad, this is fun. And so she sits down on the couch and she's really excited and she opens up that mind. Well, Dad, how do I open up my mind? This is weird. Like, does it opening up my mind? Does she, you close your eyes. Oh, I close my eyes, Dad. Okay. Close your eyes and picture the tooth fairy. Oh, gosh, Dad, I see her. Oh, my. She's right here. Dad, she's got red hair. She's got freckles. Oh, Dad, she's so cute. You got to see what she's wearing. I want a pair of boots like these. I'm like, Oh, okay. this is pretty good. And then she says, Dad, there's not just one tooth fairy. There's a village. Dad, they have a village. And she walked me through 45 minutes of a process of the tooth fairies. This is beautiful. Because we need a generation who can dream big. We need to dream big. We need to get out of this robotic state that we live in to find our true destiny. But we have to build this muscle on both sides. I'm not saying, hey, let's get rid of all the left brain. That would turn into the school systems we have today. Nor am I saying, hey, let's get rid of, it. Let's get rid of all the left brain and, and just go all the right brain. That would turn into Hogwarts and you have little kids with wands. But when you build the balance and they start working together, magic starts happening in the classroom. And this is why my partner and I, we started um, the school that we did. And we work in a public school system, but we do the Quest Leadership Project. It's a class within the school. We open up their minds in a big way. In fact, today we had the first entrepreneur fair. It was amazing to see what these kids 
came up with. But we went left brain and we were like, okay, we've got to have plans and we've got to have market research. This is how you do this. And we went through all of that. But you know what? They were excited about the left brain stuff. You know why? Because they were doing what they loved. Oh my gosh, I'm going to sell all these t-shirts. Oh my gosh, look what I created. I created cactus juice. It was actually pretty good. It's amazing what happens. There's a girl, I work a little bit, at times up in Park City, and there's a girl, she is in middle school, and they gave her this opportunity, and they said, let's dream big. And she said, well, I've always been fascinated with solar energy. And so with solar energy, she said, I'm going to go hit it. She had to learn science. She had to learn math, but she was so excited doing it because it had meaning behind it. And she ran to it. And now the school system, they're using her plan to create solar energy within the school. It was that good. And it was better than a lot of what your generation might bring because we have shut ourselves into this box. This is an amazing time in America. We are close to a tipping point. We're on a verge of a new cycle. We're on the verge of a new era. And we don't want to look and see what's really happening. We want to put our blinders on because we can't go there. Our minds haven't been trained big enough to say, oh my, there is opportunity within crisis. Oh my, it's the natural man and the spiritual man. We are going to grow. As I teach my students the cycles of where we have been and where we are going, they get so excited. And then they go tell their parents, it's just, uh, just focus on your math and your science. We do that. We don't let them dream. We don't let them create. It's amazing. Uh, Jill Bolt Taylor, she is a brain scientist, and she goes through, and I can't do this for you because that is way out of my league. She goes through the cerebral cortex, she goes through the limbic system, she goes to the pituitary, she goes to the cerebellum, and she goes through, and she says, most of us think of ourselves as thinking creatures that feel. But we are actually feeling creatures that think. Think of that concept. We feel first. The creation comes first. The spiritual creation. We feel and then we act upon those feelings. Everything in here was created by a thought. I have this thought to put an exit sign right there. I'm going to put it there. And it created the action. We have to feel how awful it would be to have a kiss without that feeling. I have a hot wife and I would hate that. I don't know why she married me, but she did. We need to feel and we need public school systems or private school systems or home systems that bring that feeling inside of us. And as we do that, then the thinking comes naturally. But we need a generation of feeling. Because from the feeling comes that destiny. And as we feel, we do great things. As we've gone on with Einstein, I'll continue with Einstein. He says, you cannot solve a problem from the same conscious that created it. You must see the world anew. We need a new generation of thinkers, creators, innovators, entrepreneurs, or we're screwed as a nation. So, as Bill and I created this, uh, this uh, school, uh, we didn't know how it would go. Last, yesterday was the last day of class for the trimester. And 
And uh, we brought together this right brain and left brain. We brought them the principles and then gave them time to just do what they wanted with those things. And they created, they came through. And people bought their stuff. What better report card is that? They bought their stuff today. I spent $200 myself. But there was one particular student that I think had the biggest impression on me. The first day of class, I enter, and there he is in the very back with a hood over his head and a cloud. It was unbelievable, this cloud hanging over his head. And he was angry, and he was sad, and he was, as he let us know every day, an atheist. Something happened to him, though, over the course period. Very slowly, instead of having his headphones in, it's amazing when you allow kids with phones and they come to school, headphones, man, he had those things in. He listened to his music during class. But it's amazing what happened. Slowly, one of those headphones came out. And then over time, the other one came out. Weeks pass, and then he moves forward, and he takes off the hoodie, and he starts sitting with the class. After our discussions, he came up, and he started shaking my hand and telling me thank you after class every day. And then yesterday, our last day of class, he came up and hugged me. I did not use the word God once, but what I did do is I taught with the Spirit because I med, may help them as a mentor to help them find the destiny within themselves. And he felt something. My ancestors did not come to America to learn math and science. Those who did that, they went to China. My ancestors came here because they knew that America was different. They came here because they knew that America was a place that any dream that they had, they could become that dream. They knew that in America, they could create and they could build and they could do something special that the world has seen as so, so very few points in time during the lifespan of life. The fire burned within their souls of their destiny, of their purpose, of their life mission. Instead of keeping that momentum going, things are so good today we only look forward and we stop using our peripheral vision. We need leaders of a new generation. Not just students, we need you as parents. Generation to think differently. Generation to open up their hearts and expand learning. Not just stay back and stuck in the past, but to expand what we learn and make it poignant for our lives today. It has been a pleasure to be here, and I'll turn the time over to Oak.